Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hello, welcome to our another episode of Alexandra Speaks today with our fantastic headliner of the African Book Festival 2022. Yes, a few more months. We have July. No, today is July. next month. Next month. It's one more month. Yes. Wow, so the excitement is rising. We can't wait to meet all the all the amazing personalities, all all combined in one festival. So clearly, do tell everyone. <laughs> so Margaret Busby, there is so much about you to say, but I would like to focus on you being a publisher, like a legendary publisher, and basically um, creating a path so for so many women writers as one and as well you're an editor so you like to actually help to bring all these stories to life in that sense and you do a lot of other empowering things so today we would just like to get a small glimpse of who you are your personality and then if you would like to know more about you get to know you more they can meet us live in berlin 26th to 28th of august so first of all, welcome, dear Margaret. So thank you, Alexandra. You. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> How are you today? Today I'm feeling fine. I am here in Africa, in Sierra Leone, and I've had a wonderfully busy week. And the sun is shining. Excellent. And I'm talking to you. I must be happy. <laughs> Likewise, I'm in beautiful Hamburg, the sun is shining. And for those of us who know Hamburg, know that this is particularly special that the sun is shining. <laughs> so I, uh, and I'm speaking with you. So this is, all of this is basically overwhelming, almost overwhelming. Uh. <laughs> so I had the wonderful pleasure. See my, I would like to show what I've, I'll show you what I have, my latest <laughs> bedtime, um, bedtime reading. Then I noticed that I might extend my bedtime hours a little bit these days. <laughs> wow, congratulations to this epic piece. I started with reading what people said about it, and um, it is amazing to see how people feel about it, how um, how this anthology makes its way, makes its way into, into the world of literature and into the world globally, and how it is um gaining universal, universal significance. I think this is kind of amazing. So therefore, you are in Sierra Leone. Tell me, your, what, name two things that inspired you during this week. Yeah, this week. Well, this, this week is, well, let me start before I got to Sierra Leone. On Friday, a week ago, last Friday, I went to the launch of an amazing book. I have to tell you about it because it's, 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 although it's a book about the black communities in, in London, it's a book that I think everybody should read. It's, a, it's almost a cross between Gordon Parks and Studs Terkel in terms of oral history. And it's called The Front Line, A Story of Struggle, Resistance and Black Identity in Notting Hill. And it's, it's full of some wonderful untold stories about the black communities and other communities in, in that part of, of, of London. And it's sort of book you won't find anywhere else. You won't find that history anywhere else. So that was my last Friday launch party. And I, I left there, I, I went home, I got a taxi to Heathrow. I got on a plane to come to Sierra Leone to attend a conference that just finished last night. So that this conference I've just been at is called, well, it's the 10th Africa Conference on Sexual Health and Rights. It's, it's, it's really been had a focus of trying to eliminate um, gender-based violence and sexual violence and focusing on the rights of women, particularly younger women. And it, it's, it's really been amazing. I, I did a uh, an interview, interviews with three wonderful African women writers um, in something called Feminist Book Club. And it's, it's all about telling stories that you haven't heard before. So that is a link from the front line in Notting Hill in London to this conference. You're hearing untold stories again. And that is the impetus behind the, you know why I did both of the anthologies, New Daughters of Africa and the previous one, Daughters of Africa, trying to showcase 
voices, words, creativity that might otherwise not get the attention they deserve. Oh, that sounds amazing. I always like to, I have actually a format called the What's Your Next Good Read? Usually I like to ask authors what they read. So that one is sorted, check. And um, yeah, <laughs> ask that book that you mentioned, The Frontline, mm -hmm. uh, how many pages are we talking about? I think that is probably over 832 pages, I think, if I remember oh. correctly. So it's another, it's another doorstopper. I was just saying, another one of the thin books. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's in the same genre of you know, stories yes. that you need to hear. And it doesn't matter how big the book is, the bigger, the better. And occasionally you have to stop because otherwise they get too expensive and too heavy and you can't post them. But <laughs> it's all about telling those stories, letting those voices be heard. And you, know, you have to do it. It has to be done. Someone has to do it. <laughs> so you said you mentioned a lot about those untold stories and voices already sometimes um, when you hear a story you are in awe and you feel like oh you tell the individual thank you for letting me know or thank you for telling me that story but what is it that drives you in particular to um to tell those stories to be an amplifier as such because mm. yeah that that's what drives you well, as, as you said, I, I started off as a publisher. I, I, I was a publisher straight out of university. I left, I graduated when I was 20 and, and I went straight into publishing. So it was, it was all about trying to make available literature that you wanted to, or you thought was important to be read by everybody. And, and we're not even talking, talking about only African writers or only black writers, because there's a lot of literature that doesn't get the attention it deserves. So that was my, my beginning as a publisher, trying to publish things that I thought were important should, should be shared with the world. And that was the same impetus behind the first anthology I did, Daughters of Africa, which came out in 1992, 30 years ago, my goodness. And that, <laughs> that because the point of the situation then, you'd have thought there were just, you know, maybe half a dozen or three or four well-known black African writers. And, you know, you know those names, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker. And, and you know, great, they, they are all in my anthology. But I wanted to say, apart from those names you've heard of, there are so many other names you should have heard of, you could have heard of, so many other books you could have read. So I had a huge bibliography at the back of that first anthology that was before the days of the internet. So I put a lot of um, pages of bibliography. And there were writers that uh, you hadn't heard of, writers who were then unknown, who are now known. So it was it was sh shining a light on, on some wonderful reading and wonderful creativity that otherwise was not getting attention. And that is the same sort of feeling I had when I wanted to do another volume because that, that first volume had gone out of print. And together with the, the publisher, Myriad Editions, who, which was headed by a woman called Candida Lacey, who had been the woman who had commissioned me to do the original Daughters of Africa. And so we got together and thought, let's do another one. And we want, deliberately wanted to have a sort of legacy with the new Daughters of Africa. So we approached people again, it was on the same basis of known names and, and names that you wouldn't have heard of until you read this anthology. And we said to them all, let's do this and let's try and have a legacy. And because of that, all the contributors, believe it or not, waived their fees. And so it enables us to have this award. We've created something called, I think the official title is the Margaret Busby New Daughters of Africa Award, which means that a woman student from Africa can go to the School of Oriental and African Studies of London University, it was done in collaboration with them, and have a free course of study. And we've already had the first student who's, who's done that course, um, she was a Kenyan called Idza Luhumyo, and she, she has finished the course, she went to Texas, and she is now on the shortlist of the Kane Prize. Mm -hmm. So within three years, she's benefited from the award that this anthology made possible. And she's just showing what can happen when you're, you're given opportunities, when, when you, you're sort of 
empowered, when you're encouraged, when you're helped, when you, you pass the baton. So that's, that's the spirit behind this anthology and the previous one. That, that, that's, that's how I live my life, actually. <laughs> This is uh, this is indeed very um when 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 I just heard this story and the kind of things that happened first you have the idea the idea is very great then you find you try to find allies you try to find people that are on board with this idea and then in your case you quite you found quite a few <laughs> <laughs> who are on board and then out of this amazing anthology one would have th thought that this in itself is a major huge testimony legacy and then it is actually a continuation of empowering. Mm empowering more people basically setting the path for new new what is the new after the new neuro daughters <laughs> <laughs> that, well, there's, there's that ripple effect it's you know people just in the same way as somebody may have read the first volume and been encouraged or influenced to become a writer because you know that that, that has happened there was one writer who um is in the in the new volume who said that she'd read the original volume and before that, she thought that because there were so many wonderful Nigerian writers, you had to be Nigerian to be a writer from Africa. So she started pretending to be from Nigeria. <laughs> and then she read Daughters of Africa. She thought, no, I can be an African writer from anywhere. Yeah. And I think that's the sort of influence that the first volume has had and, and encouraged people to think, yes, I can be an African writer and I can be published and I can have an impact on the world. And that's what I hope people will, will find when they read the second one as well. I love also the way that um, that it focuses on African writers and also um, on writers with African descent. So it opens up the space, gives so much more room for stories, mm -hmm. uh, realities and perspectives that they need to be. Well, the world is not an island anymore. It is global and therefore That's our true. voices. So I love the idea. I, I, I kind of skimmed through, saw so many names and I thought like, wow. And now it is the case that you feel like some of them, oh, I heard this name before and mm -hmm. oh, I never knew. And I feel, I don't know how it is the difference between the first anthology and the second. Maybe the first one was still for people that are already into literature, that are trying to study that field. But now I feel like, wow, I just would like to read something and I can mm -hmm. choose. I am not a literature student or in any field. I just like to read and I just like to have choices. I, I exactly. come from Germany, so I write predominantly German writers at school, at total. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, wow, and do you know this and this? I can go to a coffee place and speak about a lot of writers now yeah. in your book. And before it would be like. And I, what I also try and emphasize always is that we haven't just arrived on the scene in the last decade or two decades, because it's, it's always this historical sweep. So this anthology begins with a Nigerian feminist, actually, who was born in the 1790s. So it's like a showcase for 200, and it ends with people born in the 1990s. So it's 200 years of African women's creativity and in every genre. So it, it can be poetry, fiction, short stories, um, polemic, um, any, any genre you like, letters is represented. And it's, it's not that I, I curated it and told people what to write. This is just, the outpouring of creativity, which is just so marvelous and just so enjoyable. You don't have to start at the beginning and read to the end. You can dip in anywhere and find something that will be inspirational. I, I think anyway, I, you can tell I'm excited about it. I, I can't I, stop uh, being excited. I, I understand because I know exactly who you are talking about because I read, read it and I like every book starts with a little bio of the person mm. so sometimes i'm just intrigued about the bio it's like i'm gonna mm. read it later but i just want to know who all these people are what their stories are where they are from and then and when i read um from that part i thought like oh my god uh -huh. interesting i never knew about this and this kind of mm. I felt like so 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 enriching so so yeah. far i'm really gonna like skim <laughs> and feel like it's like when your when your friend's daughter will say, "Oh, I have to do an assignment in school. I have to choose or pick a writer," you feel empowered to kind of bring names and say, "Why don't you do this?" or "Why don't you do this?" and and you know as well that she will basically enlighten also her class. Mm. It is amazing. So speaking, I'm so about glad that, you enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I I I'm still I'm still enjoying it. I must admit. Good, good, good. Since the seven hundred, I am. 
Yes, it is a little bit like a marathon. Yeah. Normally, I mean, normally <laughs> Take I'm your time. Take that, your time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm not a, a race. It's not a race. <laughs> I would not win the race. <laughs> and then, um, oh, yeah. Speaking of, are you a quick reader, a speed reader, or what are your reading strategies? Since you it do depends. Write... It depends. I, there are so many different ways I have to read. But for example, in, in 20. 2020 was it? I was chair of the Booker Prize judges, and we had to read 162 books in that year. Mm. And so that's a different kind of reading from thinking, well, I'm just going to sit by on the seashore in Sierra Leone and read something for pleasure and take my time. So it depends what I'm reading and why I'm reading it, and um, you know how much time I have, because sometimes you have to read quickly, and and you might want to reread, and sometimes you can take your time. So it depends on, I can be a very quick reader, but I can also be a very leisurely reader. Mm. Maybe we should discuss on some speed reading workshops, that would be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking about authors' voices, mm -hmm. it is sometimes, it is, um, there are a lot of young writers and then we see those writers who kind of made it the big names that have been published or even even worldly known outside of their countries but for them who are still on the way who still feel like oh is my voice heard or not how what kind of advice do you have on resilience because we still struggle i think between mm -hmm. uh, can my voice be heard will i be accepted all these kind of things that linger around well, one of the things I often say to people who talk about being wanting to be a writer is I often say, don't write unless you can't not write. So, you know, if you're going to write because you, you just have this compulsion to write, you enjoy it, wonderful. But don't start off writing thinking, I'm going to write because I want to be rich and famous. <laughs> And I, I know a lot of people think that it's, it's some, it may be some sort of shortcut to that because they, they do see the high profile writers who've made it, whether you're talking about, I don't know, Chimamanda or whoever. And it's, it's not that they haven't had a hard journey to where they are. And that's, I'm sure, not the reason that most writers become writers is because they want to say something, they want to share it, and, and they would probably still write even if they didn't have an easy passage to, to being published. So I, th I think you have to think about why you write. You want to share something, but you also have to want to do it for yourself. Mm. Because so I think that's important. And the other thing I'd like to say is that we, we don't all have to be only writers. We can think about how we can also be publishers. I mean, th there are, there are well-known writers who have been authors and Publishers. I mean, I'm thinking about, well, in Ghana, F. Were Sutherland, she was a publisher and she was a writer. In the United States, uh, Alice Walker has been a publisher and a writer. You know, there, there, Tony Morrison was an, you know, an editor as well as at the same time that she's writing novels. So you, you don't always have to think, well, I'm a writer. I can only be a writer. I have to think about what they can do for me. I think we have to be them and us. We have to occupy every space that we can occupy, that we, we have to feel we belong in any literary space. So it's not a question of trying to mold ourselves into writing something that will fit what somebody else will validate mm. or understand even. We have to think that sometimes, how can I find a way to make it available to the people I know want to, to read it? And I mean, when I started publishing, as I said, I, I was 20. I didn't know anything about this, but I found a way to negotiate the industry. And, you know, I started a, a co-founder of a publishing company and, and the company is still going. I'm no longer with them, with my name, as it were. But you can, I think, especially in this age where there's the internet and a lot of people have, I mean, I, I'm not somebody who's up on blogs and all those things on the internet, but they are there. They weren't there. 20 years ago or 50 years ago when, when I began. And you can also learn from what other people have done and learn from what other people's mistakes. And I think also you have to think, well, maybe there are publishers there I should support. There are African publishers, there are small independent publishers, there are black publishers. 
who may not have a lot of money, but they may have what you need in terms of giving your work the attention. So that it may not be a question of looking for the biggest publisher who's going to give you the most money or you know, approaching it from, from that perspective. You also have to think, what are you bringing to the table? What are you, what are you looking for? What can you share? How can you reach the people you know you'd like to read what you're writing? I, I don't know whether I'm making sense because I, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to put anybody off being a writer because I want people who enjoy writing to be writers and to work at being good writers. And it's always useful actually to have somebody as a sort of first reader, a close friend or somebody you trust so that you can share, show them what you're writing. It's not that every single word you write is always gonna be perfect, but somebody may be able to give you some feedback that will help improve your writing so that you're just gonna get better and listen to what other people's responses. And, and in the end, fingers crossed, everything crossed, you may reach the people that you would like to share your words with. That's us. That's very beautiful. Thank you so much for this impact. So one last question, I think. What are you looking forward to most um, when you come to Berlin? Is there something particularly that you're looking forward to, expect to see, to listen to? I always look forward to meeting new people, finding out what other people are doing that excites them. I'm going to find out what excites you, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> So no, I, 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 I'm, I'm approaching it with an open mind and I hope there'll be lots of things I didn't even know I was looking for that I'll enjoy and find when I reach Berlin. Oh, lovely. That is so amazing. I am really looking forward to, to all of this. So I think we've come to the end already and I hope people have enjoyed our talk. I, I have. Did. <laughs> Thank you, Alexandra. So I'm looking forward to continue. Oh, last one. Do you have any questions? Um. Yes. Is there anything you'd like to ask me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just, I want to know what you've written that you're going to show me when I get to Berlin. Um, actually, I am not a writer yet. I am a storyteller. So I'll tell you my story first, and then we can discuss further whether I should bring it to paper or not. I always say, if you can tell a story, you can write a story. You are a writer. You just haven't written down your story. Uh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. This is the nicest thing anybody has said to me today. <laughs> Actually, the entire week. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, Thanks, it was so lovely. So, please enjoy your stay. Thank you so much for taking the time. And then I will see you next month. And to all our listeners, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you as well for tuning in. See you all at the festival 26 to 28 August. Thanks, Alexandra. Take care. Bye. Bye.